With us now is U.S. Attorney Kevin Ryan, whose office is responsible for representing the federal government virtually all litigation and law enforcement uh, cases involving the United States, and the district is the Northern California District. Welcome. Thank you. Just recently, uh, towards the end of last year, the uh, the mayor's office and uh, city hall in general was very concerned by they were headed towards a record homicide rate. Right. Now I noticed that uh, there the alibi that came out of that was that gang violence actually had dropped from the year <coughs> 2004. It dropped down to 34 homicides, which is still a, a huge amount. How, what's your take on that view? That has t has gang violence actually been improved by some of the programs we're going to talk about? Well, absolutely. I think the the violence itself has been reduced by the fact that we have been very successful in our office in primarily three large prosecutions in San Francisco, um, some of which are actively working them their way through the courts now. But the big block prosecution, which involved a gang in San Francisco. They're located in? <coughs> uh, the Bayview West Point uh, area. We had indicted 35 individuals in that particular gang. All 35 have pled guilty. Uh, we have a down below the uh, gang, which is a gang that we recently indicted, um, 12 members of that gang. We believe allegedly the gang is, has been very active in, as our uh, indictment alleges, in violence, drug dealing, and things of that nature. Where do they operate out of? Sunnydale. Sunnydale, which uh, is in the Visitation Valley. Right. And then we had another Page Street uh, Western Edition gang that we indicted. That, that indictment uh, centered on um, what we believed was a killing of a witness in a federal case and we investigated the killing and we've now indicted numerous members of that gang as well as we've indicted an individual for killing what we believe allegedly a murdering a federal witness. So as a consequence of those prosecutions we've indicted a number of individuals um, and put them uh, under indictment, federal indictment and in jail. We believe that there is a, a potential nexus between the reduction in violence as we um, indict and detain and incarcerate individuals who may or may not be the ones that are responsible for a lot of the violence out there. It is true uh, from the statistics that I have seen that in the African American community as it relates to African American gangs there has been a reduction between 30 and 35 percent in gang related homicides in that particular um, community. So uh, and the three cases that I have um, referred to involve African-American gang members. You know, what's amazing, when I went to the your website that described uh, your, your cases, the ages of these individuals, it's, it's I mean, at least half of them in, in the first, that first indictment were under uh, 20 years old. Right. That is remarkable. It is. That, and, and they're cold, <coughs> and, and you're alleging in the cases that they are effectively cold-blooded murderers. I mean, there's no, there's no, uh, compassion here, it's just a job, or something has to be done, and, and, and I'm sure you've seen that straight ahead when you watch, yes. when you interviewed them and, or, and so on. Well, not only in the cases that we've indicted, but just generally, we've seen some very uh, violent tendencies and violent crimes committed in the communities, and they're almost mind-boggling sometimes. Uh, the reasons over which someone may be killed, the manner in which someone is killed, multiple gunshots, um, I'm not referring necessarily to the cases that mm -hmm. we've indicted, but what we're seeing is a level of violence that uh, goes back to the time in the 80s when the, the quote unquote crack wars were going on. There was a lot of violence associated with the distribution of crack cocaine. We're seeing a high level of that again. And we're also seeing young offenders, uh, what we call juveniles. And in the federal system, we don't typically deal with the juvenile offender. But we are seeing a lot of young people, 14, 15, and even younger, who have guns, who have access to guns, and who are actually um, committing but we believe crimes. Your, uh, your, your, uh, your project included obviously a lot of surveillance and, and I mean it took many, several years to. Some, to, some cases, yes. And I, what I was uh, also found interesting is that the, the gangs do have different levels of uh, different, different warriors, different soldiers, and you know, many of them I'm sure are young that, that are lookouts and so on. They have names for all of them. Maybe you could describe that, especially when they st stash this, the drug uh, materials to protect themselves from other gangs besides the police. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing, and you got to remember, we're using our RICO statute, which is our racketeering influence corrupt organization statute, which is a federal statute that was originally designed to go after the mob. Organized it's crime. Organized crime in the traditional sense in New York and back in the days of uh, Rudy Giuliani as a U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. And those gangs or those groups or those organizations had a type of structure that's different than what you see in a violent street gang. 
There is a looser organization or a looser structure in a violent street gang, but there are still the uh, leaders, those that are calling the shots, those are giving allegedly green lights, which are uh, orders to kill or uh, shoot or kidnap or do something with another person. Uh, and it can all center on uh, trying to enhance your standing in the gang, uh, whether or not someone is believed to have been a snitch, quote unquote, whether someone's believed to have ripped off uh, someone in a drug deal. So there are shot callers, there are shooters, there are even things I've seen over the years that, um, like community guns. We're seeing guns being stored or located in a particular area in a community uh, so that various members can have access to it on a quick basis. Um, and a lot of times, if they're not carrying the gun on their person or it's not in their home or it's not in their car, well, if you happen to be detained by a police officer, you're not in possession of it. Mm -hmm. So we've seen guns, I've seen guns in my career hidden in bushes and um, carbine rifles and, and individuals who know where that is can get it quickly and use it for whatever purpose they want. The, the, main, the main thing is what you're talking about is not abstract. It's here in the city and county of San Absolutely. Francisco, these gangs that you're talking about. That, uh, going back to my original question, uh, the police department was proud that there were only 34 of these homicides last year. Therefore, the other uh, 50 or 60 that made up a near record of almost 100 homicides were what they called non-preventable. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if, if that's something you want to get into, but because you're, your focus is obviously on gang warfare right. and, and so on. Do you have <coughs> any thoughts about that when you compare it to San Jose and some other cities in your, in your district? Well, I, I, it's clear that San Francisco has seen an upswing recently as well. I think Oakland was tracking or trending up towards the end of the year. We're seeing it happen in a lot of urban cities. Boston is, is tracking up again, is spiking, and other communities are. There are homicides in a society such as ours that are quote unquote non-preventable or they may be preventable but the police can't be there to stop it. For example, a domestic violence situation or the horrific situation with the woman here in San Francisco who allegedly threw her children or did throw her children into the bay. That's three murders or three homicides, depending on how you look at it, that probably were not preventable. What we're looking at is a structure and a, an approach to the most violent offenders in our community. Those that we believe are the ones that are creating the most problems through their own criminal history and through the information that we are able to develop through our task forces. And we're trying to figure out uh, the best way to approach a problem where we know generally who the offenders are and what they're engaged in and we take a long-term approach to it. And it's not all about incarceration and enforcement. We do have other aspects, but in the area where we believe we can make a difference is we can identify a gang, we can identify its territory, we can identify who its members are, we can identify who's doing what. Uh, if they're dealing drugs, we can have an impact there. If they're shooting people, we can have an impact there. If they're selling uh, guns or uh, involved in the gun trade, we can have an impact there. And what we do is take a long-term approach, look at the organization, and really attempt to undermine and take down the organization itself. Before we go there, and I do want to go back to that, uh, but when you compare the rates of homicides, gang member homicides or attempted murders in Richmond, Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose, that uh, drop that San Francisco s saw, was that something that you saw in those other four or five cities in your district? No. I think that, uh, I think that what you saw in San Francisco was a concerted effort under um, uh, various programs, our Safe Streets programs and our program with the mayor's office, uh, in an effort to identify and really um, make an impact, and those are impact prosecutions. Uh, these other areas di didn't see the spike in violence, although Richmond, it's debatable whether it has, and whether or not we can be of assistance to other communities around the Bay Area using this model uh, remains to be seen. You mean you're not working as closely with those uh, police departments as you were with San Francisco? I think we have a very, very good relationship with the San Francisco Police Department, and uh, it's, it's taken a couple of years to get to the point where we are, but we have developed a working uh, protocol, if you will, that is very positive and very uh, it flows both ways. There's a hundred percent commitment from them. There's a hundred percent commitment from us. We we do have good relationships with Oakland, and with Richmond, and with the sheriff's office in these various counties. But at uh, one point, the San Francisco Police Department and uh, my office decided to take a real good look at this about two years ago, and we've been working very very hard, uh, hard to solve or help solve the problem. Um, that's not to say that we're not um, otherwise looking at other areas around the district. 
You know, I, I guess I'm kind of curious uh, how much you know about these gangs. You know their, you know the leaders' names. You know their structure. I'm curious, and uh, how how do you get that information? How does that information come out? Well, it starts out with the policemen in the in the communities in the neighborhoods. They know, and the community knows who the problems are in their community, whether it and whatever community it is. If there is violence and there are shootings and there is drug dealing. The people who live in these communities, first and foremost, know who is engaged in it. Part of the issues and part of the problems for us is getting the community to cooperate with us and to inform us of that. Uh, oftentimes we find out informally, uh, the police officer on the beat, which is why it's so important to have a relationship with the local police department. They know the individuals in their particular beat or where they work, who are the ones that they keep encountering, either dealing drugs or around guns. And so it starts from the ground up. And then there's other investigative techniques that we can use um, to identify, including cooperation from cooperators, cooperation from people who are part of the gang and who may or may not be arrested and or cooperating. People you mean once, once, the, once you've arrested them, there's... there's yeah. Yeah. Sometimes look, some you get cooperation. Sometimes, you know, we find out uh, via various other techniques who's doing what and what they're doing. Uh, you'd be amazed. But th you mentioned that uh, the, the federal witness was actually murdered, and, 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 they, and, and the technique, as I understand it, in, in anti-terrorism and counterinsurgency is to create paranoia within the group, to create a natural paranoia. It helps to disrupt the operation if they think they can't trust everybody. Right. Are you, do, you, do you do that intentionally, and, and why would people come forward and talk to you when they, they, they have th such an attitude towards snitches? They're probably at the top of the list to be targeted for murder. Uh, how do you get uh, groups uh, to, to turn on, on each other like that? Well, people will testify or give you information for a variety of reasons, many of which are reasons of self-motivation. They're in trouble themselves. They've gotten themselves sideways of the law. They and themselves have been arrested for something, and they want to um, attempt to, new, to either negotiate or to become, uh, to lessen the sentence that they may um, get by cooperating with you. Others are community activists or people in the community that will come forward. They may not want their names used, but they may call a, a, an a anonymous phone line or call someone or l let the local officer know. We do have ways in which we can get information. Sometimes it's not admissible uh, in an actual trial, but it's admissible to build a case and upon which we can get the building blocks and find out who may have done something in a particular, you know, there's a homicide, no one knows what happens. Well, an officer on the street may know someone who saw it, but that person doesn't want to come forward. There may be someone in custody who overheard a conversation, and uh, they call up the uh, officer that they have a relationship with. It, and it can be as simple as that. And it, it's working. I mean, at least it's working in San Francisco. Well, it's working. Uh, I believe our indictments have been very successful, and it's working in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. And thanks for being with us. U.S. Attorney Kevin Ryan. And uh, you stay with us. We'll be right back.